Paul, how are you doing? I am good, Peter. Hey, you're thinking about combine time of year. I had my annual physical this morning, and I am one pound lighter and one eighth of an inch taller than I was 28 years ago at the combine. So I'm feeling pretty good that about both is, things. That is crazy. It's awesome. It's fantastic. Paul, can you tell me, let's go back to your combine experience. What year? 1994. Okay, let's hear about it. Who, who was there? What was it like? Where was it? Was it in Indy? It was in Indy. And uh, I've been back so many times, Peter, since then. But I mean, it all, it all still looks the same. We were at the RCA Dome then, and they're at the at Lucas Oil now. But everything else, the hotels, everything looks just like it did in 1994. So let's go back to that year. There were uh, two quarterbacks in the top 10 that year, Peter. I'll give you a hint. I see one from uh, Mount West Conference area, one from the SEC. Uh, both were in the top 10, yes. Wow. That wasn't the Dan McGuire year, was it? No, although Dan McGuire started his career at Iowa. Um, wow. but, um, so that year, 94, it was Heath Schuler and Trent Dilfer were the top oh 10 quarterbacks. God. So those were the guys we were all wow. chasing. And uh, they didn't work out. But I remember being in the elevator with them, you know, being around dinners with those two guys. Uh, my roommate was Gus Farratt. We were the throwing quarterbacks that year, Peter. So we went early and stayed late through 10,000 balls. I'm still icing my shoulder from, from all the throwing we did that, that week. Explain but, to people what that is, Paul. Yeah, so obviously all the quarterbacks uh, get invited to go work out for a couple of days, get physicals. But a couple of the fringe quarterbacks, guys that were you know maybe the last ones invited, and that you know, certainly counts for Gus and I that year, they get asked to come early and throw all the drills to the defensive backs, to the running backs, um, you know, hold for all the kickers and then stay late and do, do the drills for the linebackers as well. So every football that needs to be thrown at the combine outside of the ones for the quarterbacks and receivers, there are two guys that go early and stay late. And back in 1994, that was me. Wow. And who were the receivers you threw to that year? So I threw to Derek Alexander, who ended up being a first round pick at Michigan. Yeah. I think also in my group, I had Lake Dawson from Notre yeah. Dame. Yeah. Uh, I think Lake was working for the Titans until maybe recently. I, I'm not sure if Lake is still yeah. in the business. Didn't he get drafted uh, by Kansas City? There you go. Yeah, drafted yeah. by the Chiefs. Yeah. Those two guys stand out to me. Uh, I don't remember the other receivers as well, but I, I threw to those two guys that entire afternoon. Um. What's the pressure like for a player going to the scouting combine? It was different then, Peter, because now everybody's seen it on NFL Network. So even though there is a lot of pressure when you're there performing for your own draft stock, you've seen it pretty much your entire life at this point. Uh, back when I went, I remember uh, my agent uncovered an old VHS tape from the year before of like Trent Green and Drew Bledsoe and Elvis Gerback throwing, uh, Mark Brunel as well. So I remember, you know, knowing a little bit what was coming, but it was all a wide eyed. I wasn't quite sure how it was going to go kind of experience because it wasn't all on TV every year. So it was, a, there was a lot more mystery back then. It seemed like a bigger deal because I'd, I'd heard about it, but hadn't seen it. Whereas now all these kids have seen every single drill they're going to do. They've watched it on live TV pretty much their entire lives. You know, the story I always tell everybody, my vintage combine story in the year 2000 I would you know I've tried to remember over the years and I've asked a bunch of the old vets uh when did you start covering the combine that was one of my first ones um and I remember there was 15 or 20 media people there yeah. and I think this probably would have been the same thing for you, but there was a hotel there, the Holiday Inn Crown Plaza. Yes. Yep. And that's where the base was for the combine forever. And, and, and I believe it still is. I think it's still a Holiday Inn. It's still there. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's still there. So, uh, so at that time, in the year 2000, with 18, 20, 22 media people there and not TV people, it was just writers. <laughs> in those days, in that, that particular year, you basically did not have, uh, 
you did not have anybody arranging interviews or setting people up to talk to the press. They didn't want the press there. They, you know, the NFL and the people who put on the scouting combine, National Football Scouting, they didn't, they wanted us far away. So they gave us no help whatsoever. So I remember in that year, Sports Illustrated sent me out there and I was going to do a story on somebody. And I had a few ideas in mind of the people in that draft crop. But I ended up, my story out of that combine ended up being on Plexico Burris. And I, I saw Plexico, he's a distinctive looking guy. You know, as you know, very tall yeah. and, and he's got kind of a real thin face. And I, I mean, I knew what he looked like, obviously. And so I literally staked out the lobby of the hotel and I waited. And one day uh, I saw him walk out of the hotel and I said, uh, hey, Plexico, I'm Peter King with Sports Illustrated. I want to write about you in the magazine next week and sort of your future in the NFL. Uh, any way you can give me some time? He said, yeah, sure. I got to do this, this, and this. And so we arranged the next day. He had a break in the middle of the day. So we were going to have lunch. We sat there. We had lunch at the Holiday Inn Crown Plaza for like an hour, hour and a half. And I wrote a story about him the next week. And it's so incredibly different these days. Like my big quarry this year, I really want to get Aiden Hutchinson. Yeah, And so, you know, he's the possible first pick in the draft. We, we, it's so early. It's almost two months away. And so you have to go through the agent and then the marketing guy. Yeah. And then they present it to him and, and all that. And I like my chances. We'll see what happens. And everybody is cordial. Everybody's very nice. But, you know, like there, there, are, there are layers now. And you used yeah. to just go out and do it, you right. know? Yeah. Uh, so, so anyway, but uh, that's interesting to hear. It's so, I, I, I tell people that, and I don't know how many people are covering it this year, but two years ago, which was the last year that the combine was here, it was right before COVID. In fact, the last day I was there last year, I went up to some general manager and uh, I stuck my hand out like I wanted to shake his hand. And he and he gave me a little fist bump and and he goes, hey, I'm a little worried about this virus. Hmm. And that was about the first time that anybody even kind of made mention of it because we were hearing a lot about it. And then, you know, a week, maybe 10 days later, everything is shut down. The NBA stops and everything stops. But now this year, I think, is really going to be about the first year that football will kind of feel like it's mostly back to normal. Right, right. Just sitting here thinking about the combine, Peter, a couple of other things come to mind. I remember when I was there in 94, right before I ran the 40-yard dash, I walked by Al Davis, and, and he knew my name, the late Al wow. Davis. And I, I remember thinking, oh, my God, Al Davis knows who I am. And just that, that pit of nerve excitement that I have from that, I can dial that yeah. up and remember it so well. And then 2005, uh, NFL Network, I, I had just started there, Peter. I hadn't even been there a year. And we were trying to see if, if the combine had any, any kind of television traction. It was Mike Mayock and I on director's chairs on the field at the old RCA Dome, just the two of us watching 40s, watching drills. And at the top of every hour, like three minutes before every hour, our producer would get in our ear and say, guys, we're going to stay on. Just do another hour. And it happened every hour. Like, I don't know how they knew, but they were they were getting a feeling that people might be watching. And uh, Mike and I just sat out there and talked about drills uh, for hours at a time back in 05. And then that next year, they made it the giant television production that it is and that you see on NFL Network. So um, love the combine, Peter. A lot of great, distinct, kind of unique don't you, think, don't you think right now that Mike, Mike Mayock has to have withdrawal? That he's not doing the combine for the next seven days. I, I'm, I'm going to call him up there and say, my man, this is probably the first time in like 18 years you haven't spent the entire week at the combine for one reason or another. Uh, he, he might be happy to not be there once, but yeah, 
It's uh, that this was totally his miss, thing. I bet he misses it. I bet he misses it. Hundred percent. I may, I I may reach it. out to him to do something for my column next week. It would be yes. Yeah. But um, hey, let's let's go through the combine, and I should say to everybody. I know we've been reminiscing here, but <laughs> my guest later on in the podcast is going to be Daniel Jeremiah of NFL he Network. Did. He's going to give you a really good meat and potatoes preview of this scouting combine. We'll talk a little bit about it, and then we'll get into some other things around the league and then hang around uh, halfway through my conversation with Daniel Jeremiah. And I think you'll then be ready if you care. I mean, there's a lot of people. I'm not the biggest combine guy in the world. Um, It's not anything where I my calendar revolves around it or anything like that. But I do understand and I recognize that it is sort of a tent pole now in the NFL calendar that everybody, for one reason or another, looks forward to. As a matter of fact, I told uh, Jeremiah, Daniel, when we were talking on Saturday night, I said, my favorite part of the scouting combine, quite honestly, I said, Mayock started it, now you do it, is when you spend seven, eight, 10 minutes of the doldrum times of the combine where, you know, you're waiting for this to happen or that to happen or something where you just say, all right, let's download what we think about the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah. And then you just break down everything, what the weaknesses, their strengths, how their cap looks, what they're going to do in free agency, everything like that. And the reason why I really like that is that it kind of gets your brain to start thinking, okay, all right, yeah. You know, Tampa Bay, boy, Ali Marpet, that's a big loss at yeah. guard, sixth rated guard by PFF last year. But it isn't only that. The two other interior players, center and guard, are both free agents and they both could leave. And in fact, how about, if all three of your interior linemen plus Tom Brady all of a sudden vanish. And so that is yes. what you start to think about with all these teams. And I, I told him, I really, really appreciate that. And his answer was cool. He said, you know, that, that is a gigantic amount of homework for him. And, and I'm sure for Rich Eisen too, because then they're all going to talk about it on the set, but I'm going to start. I got three little bullet points about the combine that I wanted to hit you with. Number one, this will be probably one of the two drafts in this century, century starting with 2001. This is going to be the 22nd draft of this century. And this will be along with 2013 when EJ Manuel went 16th. Probably the worst uh you know quarterback year in the draft since then to refresh everybody's memory three quarterbacks picked in the top 80 that year it was ej manuel at 16 it was geno smith at 39 and it was mike glennon Mm. at 75 and so this year it's not going to take until 75 for the third quarterback to be picked I don't think, but it's a very, very lean crop this year. Obviously, Kenny Pickett, the pit guy, could be the first pick. Malik Willis from Liberty uh, has a chance to get picked high uh, as more of a project. Sam Howell of UNC, some people think he's a borderline uh, first-round pick. Um, And the Ole Miss guy, um, I'm drawing a blank. Um, Matt Corral. Matt Corral, sorry, uh, is is also a candidate to go fairly early. But Paul, you watch college football a lot more than I do. Mm-hmm. What do you think of these guys? And do you think we'll see more than one team risk a one on one of these quarterbacks? I think we will. I, I don't know enough yet to say uh, which two it'll be, but you know how this thing works, Peter. I mean, everybody wants to have a quarterback and that desperation can lead to overdrafting at that spot. And I think it'll happen again. I don't know if it'll happen in the top 10, uh, but I'd be surprised if there weren't a couple quarterbacks that go. 
Um, my specific thoughts right now at this early point, Peter, I saw Kenny Pickett play twice in person, and it's a credit to how much he grew this past season that he's being discussed in this way uh, and how much it matters to a quarterback to be a three- or four-year starter because these kind of gaps of giant improvement – can be out there. I mean, they're not that common, but they can be had by guys with a couple of years experience and some nice talent. They can take that last year and run with it. That's what comes to mind first. But when I watched him, Peter, I, I didn't once think, Hey, this is a future first round pick. And I didn't see him play much this last year, but I saw him play early in his career. And it's, it, it, again, it says a lot about how much he developed and it says a lot about this class as a whole. If Kenny Pickett is the best guy out there, I think that's a terrific example for what you're saying. You're, you're correct to wonder how early one might go and if there might even be a couple go in the first. I also thought it might be interesting to, to discuss a little bit about, you know, there's a bunch of teams in this draft that, that obviously the, this is a very big draft for. And, you know, living in Brooklyn, and being surrounded by Giants and Jets fans. You know, I don't want to break it to them. They're all excited. They both got two picks in the first 10 picks. Uh, the Giants picked five and seven. You remember last year, they got the Bears number one when the Bears moved up and gave this year's one to the Giants so they could move up and get Justin Fields. And the Jets have picks number four and 10. The 10th pick is Seattle's. And Seattle traded uh, their 2022 number one as part of the package to get Jamal Adams. But the thing I was going to say is, man, it's great to have two picks in the top 10. You can really help rebuild your team. But, man, not a great year to have two picks in the top 10. Because, you know, the top of this draft is not laden with absolute can't miss guys. And, and in fact, I think. It will not surprise me at all. And that's one of the things I'm going to look at when I go to Indianapolis later this week. I think at the very least, the Giants might look to move one of those picks to try to get a, a, a decent to high pick next year in the first round. And there's a method to my madness. Uh, next year, the quarterback crop is going to be significantly better. The Giants will not. Uh, pick up the fifth year option, I don't think, on Daniel Jones, the quarterback. So basically, this is Daniel Jones' year to, sh and he could, he very well could, to show Brian Dable he should be the quarterback of the future. But, you know, you look at Daniel Jones, it's his fourth year. He's going to be in his third different offensive system. His head has got to be spinning, learning a new system again. Um, so, to me, this is going to be a really, really interesting year for a bunch of teams at the very top of the draft. And I wonder, Paul, when you hear that it's not a great year at the top of the draft and you're one of those teams, I mean, is it logical to think about trading, even though there may not be a great market for teams wanting to trade up? If you're in that top 10, though, especially like the Giants, Peter, if you have a couple picks in the top 10, let's say you're down there in the six, somewhere down between six and 10, there could be, there will be uh, multiple examples of the number one player at a position on the board. And you know how this works. Some teams will have him valued a lot higher than the Giants do or the Jets do. There's still some pretty good trade potential for the number one player at these positions. So right. even though maybe as a whole, it's not a wonderful class at the top I bet there's still be there, there'll be some teams that really want that top player at that position so I think they could trade it and even though there's not a great feeling about quarterbacks right now there could still be some really good players that are worth pick six through ten and hey right. the Giants could use a number of positions I mean outside of the quarterback discussions which certainly fit for that team I I, I don't think it's that bad of a spot to have two picks that high I think it could work out pretty well I think the Jets uh, are really an intriguing team this year. And we'll get into this a little bit before the draft starts. They're the, uh, they, uh, they are a team that has four picks in the top 38. Remember, they got Seattle's pick in the first round. And a lot of people don't remember this, but they also have 
Carolina's pick in the second round. And that comes from the Sam Darnold trade a year ago, excuse me. And if you were the Jets right now, um, you you start to get in what, what I really think about is kind of the treasure trove area of the draft, because you'll hear a lot of the draft experts say this. Daniel Jeremiah gave me a great line that one team's 15th player in this draft is another team's 40th. Um, and, and, it, and it, you know, it's, it's one of these years that it's a beauty in the eye of the beholder draft. I mean, in, in, in essence, a lot of drafts are like that, but the jets uh, right now go four, 10, 35 and 38. They're really in the best position of any team, you know, in this draft, Philadelphia is in really good position, uh, but they don't have an exceedingly high pick. They go 15, 16, 19, and then they don't go again until 51. So those are teams that I think, um, you know, are obviously going to be in position to really buttress some of their huge need positions. There's one other team in this draft, and, and I think is in an absolute total sweet spot of this scouting combine. I want you to follow me on this a little bit. The Baltimore Ravens pick 76th in the third round that's their pick is right in the middle of the third round um so they pick 76 in the third round then they also have what i think is going to be about the 98th pick because they're going to have a pick from um david cully member of the the nfl rule last year that every team uh that had a minority coach or general manager hired uh, from them, they get two third round picks for developing that coach and sending them on to be a head coach or a GM. So they pick, uh, you know, around 78 and then 98, 99 with a uh, compensatory pick right in there at the end of the third round. But then after those mid and low third round picks, they have five picks in the fourth round. And so if you think about this and you think about the position that the Ravens are in, they basically are going to have seven picks where guys like Daniel Jeremiah says, you'll find starters at tight end, at safety, in the interior line, uh, even at wide receiver. You're going to find players right in that what in essence is about a, a 50 pick range for the Baltimore Ravens. They're, they're going to, you know, they're going to have seven picks right in there. So I think they're a little bit of an under the radar team as a team that really could get rich in this draft, Paul. Yeah. I would imagine uh, knowing this guy fairly well, that the Ravens general manager, Eric DaCosta is probably more excited about those picks then some teams pick into the top 10 right now because, I mean, whether it's the Ravens, the Rams, the Bengals, I mean, these teams that do well, if you actually go look at their depth chart, it is loaded with, with picks from rounds three, four, five, undrafted free agents. Every team has a ton of those. I mean, thinking about the third round for the Ravens, I think they got Mark Andrews there. They might have gotten De uh, Duvernay there, who's a quality contributor on that team. So I am sure they are ecstatic about building the middle part of their roster, maybe finding a star or two, but finding a bunch of quality starters with those picks that you just mentioned. You know, I made a little list of these because I was going to write about this further in my column, but I decided to wait till closer to the draft because it's not really a combine story. But <clears throat> I want you to think of the guy, of the people that the Ravens uh, have picked in the draft after pick number 70. OK, defensive tackle who they really rely on right now, Justin Matabuike, um, uh, who's coming off a bit of an injury plagued year, but but, you know, a really valuable player for them. Uh, then you go back, as you said, Paul, to 2018, Mark Andrews and Orlando Brown. 
Mm-hmm. Both uh, were picked in the 80s that year. Then you go to, uh, you know, 2016. If you look deep into that draft, number 146 overall, seventh ra- or fifth round pick, Matt Judon. Um, then you go the previous year to that, Zadarius Smith, 122nd overall. Um, and you keep going back and back, and you over and over again, you see this team, Kyle Juszczyk, 130, Ricky Wagner, 168. Over and over again, you see the why the Ravens, look, I'm just telling you because I've, I've talked to some people there. They are rubbing their hands in glee right now. They are so excited about this draft. This is going to be a real long-term crucial day for the Baltimore Ravens or crucial weekend for the Baltimore Ravens. So let's leave that. We'll get into that probably a little more closer uh, to the time of the draft. But I also wanted to talk about uh, some news uh, that happened in the hours before we're recording this as we record on Monday afternoon. Kyler Murray's agent, Eric Burkhart, uh, an absolute staunch advocate for his guys. Uh, Eric Burkhart came out with a statement, a long statement, and you read between the lines and you don't have to read much between the lines. They are not happy with the status of negotiations uh, with uh, their quarterback, Kyler Murray, after finishing his third year with the Cardinals. And and, uh, they seem to be really pushing to try to get a deal done for their, for his client, Kyler Murray in this statement that he issued. Paul, I'm going to ask you just a a very, you know, direct blunt question. Your call. What do the Cardinals do with Kyler Murray? Pay him or make him self-prove himself one more year after an up and down season he just had. I think, I think you make him have a prove it year, Peter. And follow me here on this one. I think when, when Steve Kahn, general manager, when he sits down with all his people and all the coaches, I think they feel very good about the direction this is going. I mean, there's a lot more reason to feel good about Kyler Murray than to doubt him. When you list the positives next to the negatives, the positives are a lot more. However, there is a, there's a negative there that's a repeating pattern that's really disturbing if you're talking about paying him $30, $40, 50000000 million a year, whatever it would be. To, to pay a young quarterback each year for the next few years. And that is the end of the seasons for, for Kyler and for the team have gone this way instead of up. And that's, that's a pattern that has to be attached to the quarterback. Uh, last year, they started out great. They finished up two and five. When you boil it down even more, they lost a pair of divisional games, super important divisional games to end the year last year. And the offense didn't play that well uh, this year. I think they're seven and zero at one point. They lose yeah. five of their last six games, and I know he was hurt. But th- this is this is part of what happens to a quarterback. You either play well when you're hurt, like every other quarterback in the NFL, or every other player in the NFL in December, or you don't. He didn't play well down the stretch. They lost five out of six, second year in a row. His worst game, his worst moment, was the biggest one in the playoff game. So I think you feel good overall, but you cannot ignore the way the last two seasons have ended. They've ended poorly and the role he's played in it. And I think for that reason, in that reason alone, you need to see one more good year where December and January are a strong finish instead of a negative finish before you roll out that giant contract. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, I feel a little bit the same way about almost every one of these young quarterbacks that you have some questions about. You know, like Baker Mayfield. Um, I feel the same way, even though I'm more worried about Mayfield probably uh, than I am about Kyler Murray. But honestly, if, if if I were Murray and I were Eric Burkhart, the way I would do it is, hey, we're happy <clears throat> to have this year be a prove it year. Let you know, let's do it because <clears throat> if Kyler Murray signs now. I think he's going to leave some money on the table that he might regret. If he truly has confidence in his ability, I would play out this year. Remember the the Joe Flacco season 
in 2013. <clears throat> Remember when he said, yeah, I'm going to put it all on my shoulders and I'm going to put all the pressure on me. I'm going to bet on myself. I think he said, I'm going to bet on myself 50 times that year in training camp when whenever he was asked about it, hey, I'm betting on myself. I'm going to bet on myself. And so they, you know, he, he thought that he could have a great year and he had a good year. And then he had a great postseason. Remember that postseason run yeah. where he starts it, uh, you know, they win one game uh, at home and then they have a divisional game six days later on a short week. They play five and a half quarters in Denver when it's 20 degrees and they end up, he ends up throwing that, uh, you know, that bomb to end up putting them yeah. in great position to win the game in the, in the second overtime. Hey, look, I think if I were Kyler Murray, I'd bet on myself. That's just me. But <clears throat> because I honestly think, I don't know how you pay Kyler Murray 40 million a year right now. I, just, I agree. I just, I think it'd be really hard to do. Now, maybe you put in some, uh, you know, some incentives in the contract based on things like, you know, uh, what you achieve in 2022 or what you achieve in 2022 and 23. I don't know, but I'm a little bit hesitant to go nuts on Kyler Murray. And I think, I think we, we probably agree there. Um, Two other issues that I want to get to you before we get to our guest, Daniel Jeremiah. So I'm really curious. There's such a wide variety of opinion on the overtime rule. And Judy Batista of NFL Network on Twitter reported uh, some stuff on Sunday, um, I think from Indianapolis, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, because the competition committee began meetings there today, um, their annual off-season meetings uh, at the Combine. And Judy Batista reported that they are going to look both at postseason alone and then for, for all games to see if they could reach an agreement about the possibility of changing the overtime rule to allow both teams to be guaranteed a possession in overtime. And Paul, as you know, over the last decade since, since this rule has been in force, that if you score a touchdown on the first possession, the game is over. Uh, there have been 12 playoff overtime games. The team that won the coin flip to start overtime has won 10 of those 12 games. Oh, wow. And the team that won the coin flip to start overtime, scored a touchdown on the first possession in seven of those 12 games. So the second team never touched the ball in seven of those 12 games. And two teams, two games just really come to mind, probably do with you too. Uh, the AFC championship game following the 2018 season where both Tom Brady and Patrick Mahomes were out of control, hot as firecrackers. And it's 31-31 uh, at the end of regulation. The fourth quarter was so crazy. 38-point score. I covered the game. The Chiefs scored 24 points in the fourth quarter. And everybody, I remember everybody in the press box, I've never, ever been at a game or watched a game where I felt the coin flip was so important because both defenses were like paper mache that day, especially late. And the Patriots won the coin flip, scored on, scored on the first possession of overtime, and then that was the end of the game. And then, of course, this year, divisional round again involving Kansas City. Maybe karma said, okay, you guys get the benefit of the coin flip this time. Uh, the Bills lose the coin flip to start overtime. The Chiefs win it, or the Chiefs get the ball first, and obviously they go down, score a touchdown, and they win that one, I think, 42 to 36. But anyway, I only raise that to, to give you, to set the stage 
for let's hear what you think about what should happen, either regular season plus overtime or simply a regular season plus postseason with overtime or just postseason. Should there be a change? Should it stay the same? I think I'm in the minority here, Peter. I mean, you and I have talked about this a number of times uh, on on the podcast. I've I've read your opinion, and it seems like most conversations that I come across, people really want or desperately want this rule to be changed. I don't really mind the way it is. And it's a startling number that you throw out there. It makes me rethink a little when the the 12 overtime games in postseason and 10, 10 times the team that gets the ball first based off that coin flip wins. It makes me hesitate a little bit. Um, So in this moment, I'm I'm with you. But when I've thought about it in the past and when I've watched these games, I don't mind that the defense has to go out there and somehow make a play to give its team a chance to win. It doesn't really bother bother me that much. I wanted to see Josh Allen play more football last month when they lost in Kansas City. Uh, But as a rule, um, this isn't my hot button topic for the competition committee. I mean, I wish they would let defensive backs jockey a little more for the football and let the rushers hit the quarterback a little more. I'd rather see that be a priority than the overtime rule. But again, I know I'm in the minority. I think most people feel the way you do, uh, even though I'm not I'm not that dead set on I have to see a change. You know, obviously, I feel differently. I think that. Um, that you can say whatever you want to say about play defense and a defense is equal part of the game and all that. But if it were so, I don't want to say meaningless, but if it were so much uh, without an overbearing uh, degree of importance on the game, then why doesn't anybody ever choose to play defense to start overtime? Nobody does that. I think the last, I think, and look, I go back to um, Rod Marinelli did it once when he had a bad team in Detroit and they were playing a game, man, this really dates me. They were playing the bears in Champaign, Illinois. Oh, wow. And when, uh, when the, uh, when soldier field was being refurbished and he chose to kick off to start overtime and the bears went down and won the game. Um, Not a fine moment in Marinelli's history, but Hey, he didn't, obviously he didn't trust his offense at that time, but, but I just think in general, I just want more of a fair fight. I, 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 I don't know that I would do it. I would want to do it without changing one other rule, which is, if the first team scores a touchdown, then the second team uh, is required when it's, if it scores a touchdown to go for two and you either win or lose on going for two. And that to me would allow you to have some real thought about whether you would want to take the ball first or second in overtime. I think most teams, if they do change the rule, most teams would want to have the ball second in overtime because then they're going to know exactly what they need. If the first team doesn't score, then the second team, all you need is a field goal to win the game. But I'm, I'm encouraged because I talked to somebody pretty high in the process about a month ago said, usually takes two, three years for there to be enough momentum to change a rule like this. And there still could be, they still could need that much time. But right now to me, it appears as though, uh, it appears as though there's momentum building to try to make a change at least for overtime. Paul, you said something that really clicked in me. I listened to, uh, I, as a matter of fact, I watched uh, Chris Sims on Button last week where you and Chris were talking about some of the calls in the Super Bowl. And, you know, I had one problem with Chris's discussion because basically Chris thought that the Logan Wilson uh, holding call in overtime was a good call. Okay. And I absolutely didn't think it was a good call because 
I still have not seen absolute evidence there was holding. I saw evidence that he had his hand on his shirt, but I didn't see evidence that he had a good grab on his shirt. Be that as it may, be that as it may. The whole point is, if you're going to say while the game is going on, that man, this is a crisp game. This is really being played well. And the, the refs aren't trying to own this game and everything. Then, then you can't say on a play like the Logan Wilson play that it absolutely should have drawn a flag. Now, I don't know whether Chris thought in the first half or like in the first three quarters when there are a total of four flags thrown in 45 minutes. I don't know whether he thought that was good or bad. Most people really liked it. But the fact is, you know, and I think this is without any debate, without any doubt, the fact is that most people believe that officials have made themselves too much a part of the game in recent years, that there are just too many flags. And so if you think that the first three quarters of that game were played uh, at a crisp pace and you didn't mind uh, some of the ignored calls. And, and I don't even mean the, the T Higgins grabbing of the face mask of Jalen Ramsey. That, of course, that was missed. It should have been a call. That's the only thing that bothers me about what Chris said, because in my opinion, I would guess that there were 20 calls that weren't made in the first three quarters of this game that were more egregious than what Logan Wilson did to Cooper Cup. Yes, uh, thinking about Logan Wilson, third round pick, by the way. We were talking about third round picks in the AFC North earlier. Uh, Bengals have done a good job there as well. But uh, Chris was convinced that Logan really got a, a strong hold. I, I believe it was Cooper Cup and really kind of prevented him from going forward. I, I, I don't know if he actually just touched him or really forcefully grabbed him. Uh, but in the bigger picture, Peter, I am with you. I like it when the refs don't make those kind of calls. Uh, it's kind of like going for a rebound in basketball. There's going to be some contact. There's going to be some pushing around, some jockeying. And I would like to see them, uh, the refs being, I'd like to see the refs allow the players to get away with a little bit of that instead of calling it, uh, you know, to, to the letter of the law every single time. It, it gets old. Yeah. Hey, Paul, last thing. I, I wrote a little bit in my column this week about how uh, – how the the tv landscape is kind of going crazy yeah and uh you know troy aikman as i as i said he basically made five million dollars or four million dollars less combined in his three super bowl seasons quarterback of the cowboys than he'll make to announce 20 games on tv this year yeah so uh it's a good time to be a network TV broadcaster. And when I asked this question, I got a great letter last week from one of my readers, Stephen McGinnis of, of Evansville, Indiana. And, and here was his line. Do networks actually expect that this will result in more viewers, meaning the increased money paid to analysts? And he says, in watching the NFL for five decades, I have never once heard anyone decide to watch a game based on who the announcers are. Whoever is broadcasting the Super Bowl could pick mid-level Big 12 announcers and they would have exactly the same number of viewers. And I just said, that's outstanding. I think it's perfect because I don't know anybody who watches a game on TV. Now, I, I will say this. I will say this. It's possible, possible that in the days of John Madden, because Madden became such a feature of folklore that in the days of John Madden, it could be that, you know, if it were, if Madden was doing Seattle, San Francisco, and there was a comparable game, uh, you know, on uh, whatever it was on the uh, comparable AFC game, would some people have chosen <clears throat> to listen to Madden if they weren't a fan of any of the four teams possible? But I think the biggest issue I would say about all of this is that I just don't have much of an understanding about why money like this gets thrown around. 
and, and look great for them. Uh, sure. I'd much rather see the money in Tony Romo and Troy Aikman and Chris Collinsworth and Joe Buck and Al Michaels. I'd rather see it in their pockets than, uh, you know, some corporate uh, person, you know, in television. But I really don't understand it. Do you? Uh, it's, it's, it's crazy money. And like you, I, I'm all for it. You know, we're, we're in the sports media business. And when the guys at the top are getting paid that way, I think it means it's, Hey, it's great for those guys. Uh, it's wonderful for our side of the business. I think I, a couple thoughts come to mind. Number one, everybody thought, or a lot of people thought that when Tony Romo got that kind of money a year ago, it was just a one-off that it wouldn't affect everything. It right. is affecting everything in the number one booths for the, for the analysts and I think probably for the play, by, uh, play guys as well. Uh, number two, I love that point that the reader brought up to you, the guy who wrote you the note or emailed you about, do they really think it's going to affect the numbers? And I don't think it, it will affect the quantity on a big game. I mean, your neighbor could have called the Super Bowl, Peter. We all still would have watched the game from start yeah. to finish. Yeah. It does affect the quality and the feel. And that there's this it factor that a lot of these quarterbacks have. I wish I could describe it to a T exactly what the it factor is. But there's a feel for the number one call. I mean, whether when I was seven years old coming in from the cold uh, to, to watch a game and I heard Pat Summerall's voice, it just felt better in my house that Pat Summerall was calling the game. Uh, if yeah. I was on the couch on a Sunday in college and Pat Summerall was calling the game with John Madden, that whole afternoon felt a little bit better late in the day because that's what I was hearing. Uh, same thing on Monday nights with Frank Gifford. Same thing when, when Al Michaels makes a call. So. I'm always going to watch, but that feels going to be a little bit better when it's one of those voices that you really know and trust. You know, the weird thing that I keep thinking of with ESPN paying all that money to Aikman, um, it's so odd to me that at the same time they're doing that, they've re-upped Peyton and Eli yeah. on the alternate telecast that whether they admit it or not, Peyton and Eli are chipping away at Troy Aikman's rating. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's just I know. really, really the craziest thing, I think. I don't know. Hey, it, uh, it, it, before yeah. we go to uh, Daniel Jeremiah, I want Chuck to say hi to the audience. Hey, Chuck. Bring Chuck in there. Chuck. Yeah, where is this guy? Sit. Sit, Chuck. Okay. Here's Chuck. <laughs> and uh, Chuck is here. He hangs out with me while I work. He hangs out with my wife, Ann, and uh, he's really a fine animal. Uh, he doesn't listen that well, but um, <laughs> he's about 70% retriever. We got him from the Maryland SPCA about five years ago. He's six years old. He lived the first year of his life in a field in West Virginia. Oh, wow. And uh, so we've gotten really fortunate uh, that we've, you know, brought him to Brooklyn. We brought him to New York and he uh, he's not torn down the city or bitten too many people yet. So, but he's still a little bit spooked. It, it, the funniest thing is if I have him out for a walk in the neighborhood and it's got to happen once a week and there's a fire engine that roars past or an ambulance that roars past, Chuck will literally stop in his path and he will compete with the siren, with the, you know, just like that. So uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of fun to have him around. I would say this, Peter, we have now uh, two beings, two living creatures from West Virginia on, on Peacock. You have Mike Florio and Chuck the dog. <laughs> we doubled the tell, amount. I should, t I should really tell Mike about this. <laughs> anyway. Hey, Paul, listen, thanks a million for everything all year, all season, and this week, and uh, really appreciate your contributions and making this sane. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.